So any question from the last class? Anybody? So, so far we have seen uh, different problems and their corresponding integer programming models, right? Um, we have seen the set covering problem, the capital budgeting problem, the, uh, um, the assignment problem, the knapsack problem, right? So all these problems are the core problems of operations research and they are applied or adapted in various forms in real world applications okay so today we are going to discuss a very important problem uh, in operations research which is the traveling salesman problem right so the 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 problem is defined in this manner suppose you have uh, a source city say s right and you have certain destinations to visit. Fine. So these crosses are also uh, are different cities which the salesman will have to visit. Now there is a rule here. You cannot visit a city twice. So that is the only rule. You cannot visit a city twice. And you have to come back to your source which is s so you have to leave from the source and come back to the source by visiting all the cities in a manner that no city is visited twice so this is precisely the definition of traveling salesman problem now you can see you can easily even even manually you can figure out you know different feasible solutions right for example this is one feasible solution right So this is one feasible solution. Okay. Someone may draw another feasible solution. Say which is this one. So this is another feasible solution. So like likewise, you can have many such feasible solutions. Now you want to find the shortest path, which means you want to find that Hamiltonian cycle of the shortest length. Or the length is given by the distance between the cities, right? So you will be given uh, a distance matrix or some you know cost matrix that is the traveling cost or fuel cost right uh, you know between two cities so that is given by the cij so cij is the cost of traveling between city i and city j right now if these uh, data are given uh, for each pair of the cities involved in this network now you want to identify the hamiltonian cycle of least cost is the problem clear right so now let us yes, see sir. yeah so now let us see how you can uh, formulate it as an integer program okay so what decision variable comes to your mind so here you want to find basically the routing routing of the salesman that 
which city uh, is visited after which city right so that sequence in which the traveling salesman visits the cities will give you the uh, route of the salesman so that is why we have defined here one variable xij so which is a variable and which is one if j is immediate j immediately follows i on the tour right so that means the traveling salesman visits j immediately after i so if i to j so for example if the traveling salesman moves from s to 1 right so then this x s1 will be 1 right x s1 will be 1 fine otherwise it will be 0 right so now you can say you, you will see that uh, you know so there are so many uh, decision variables you know for each pair of the cities that are possible right so some of them will be one finally which will give you the final route of the salesman uh, through through these cities right uh, so for the for the root segments that are one you know that will take the value one so for which you will incur a cost certain traveling cost right and what is the traveling cost cig so if xig is one then you incur a cost cig cigs are also given for each pair of the cities so uh, that's why in the objective function we have written minimize summation cig xig it's clear so it gives you the minimizing of the total traveling cost right now what will be the constraints What are the constraints of this problem? What is the constraint of the problem? Tell me. Num number of outgoing edges should be one for each vertex. Mm. So the constraint, essentially the problem constraint is that no city will be visited twice. But yes, yes. Each, each city must be visited once. That means you have to yes. cover all the cities, right? So the only way to ensure is, is that at node level, so for each node, you have a condition that there will be only one one incoming edge and one outgoing edge. So how does it ensure that it will not be visited twice? Because if it is visited twice, then there will be two incoming edges. Right. And two outgoing edges also. Isn't it? And self looping is prohibited. Say you, you cannot, you know, start from this city and then come back here without traveling some other intermediate city. So self looping is also prohibited. So if you put a constraint that there will be only one incoming edge and only one outgoing edge, then you are done. It will automatically ensure a Hamiltonian cycle, right? So this is what is done here. So for each node, j belongs to v so v capital v is the set of nodes right here in the network so for at each node we have put this constraint summation xig equal to one and then you know uh, for all i right such that ij belongs to a capital a a is the you know arc set so a is the edge set or arc set right and V is the vertex set or node set. Fine. So among all the possible edges, capital A, right, for that node, you know, I to J, for all the incident edges on J, only one such incident edge will be active. All others will be zero. So for example, if I consider this node one, right, two, three, four five right now can you tell me if i write xij for this node one so this means xi one right 
So x i 1 is the variable. Now I am summing over all i, which means that you know you consider this uh, for all i belonging to the other nodes, which means say there could, could be a variable x s 1, then 5 1, right, 4 1, 3 1, 2 1. Among all such in possible incident edges, only one will be active, rest all will be zero. This is what this constraint is doing, the first constraint. Is it clear? So this is the constraint on incoming edge or incoming arc. Similarly, the second constraint is for the outgoing arc. So there will be one outgoing edge from a node. And if you look at these constraints closely, you will, you will see that these constraints look very much like assignment type of constraints. So earlier we have read about assignment problem. And there we have seen, you know, say, uh, n jobs, n people. So we are trying to match, right? One to one correspondence. So similar. So for the, the, these age restrictions, you know, constraints, we see that these are of assignment type, basically. But if we just write these two constraints, are we are, will we be able to get a feasible solution or optimal solution? That is the question. Mm. No, 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 we won't get. No, no. Why? Why? With, we might end up with two disjoint cycles. Right. Very good. So, for example, I'm showing you. Here, uh, if I consider this tour. And then this one. Suppose this is one solution. And if I have only these two constraints, right? You see, this solution satisfies these two constraints. Is it satisfying or not? Only one incoming edge and only one outgoing edge? Is it satisfying or not? It yes. is satisfying. Yes, sir. But but we can clearly say that this is not a feasible solution because you know the, the, they have found two sub tours. So these are called sub tours basically. And these sub tours they um, cause infeasibility in the solution, right? So this is an infeasible solution. So we have to do something. We have to add a new constraint to eliminate these, uh, you know, to, to, to eliminate this chance of formation of subtools. So this is what this third constraint is doing. Is everyone getting? So now you tell me that how this third constraint is able to eliminate the subtools. How does it ensure that no subtool will get formed if you add this third constraint? So what is u in the third constant? Hmm? U, u what is, is given, u is defined here, you see. U is between 2 and v minus 2. So u is any any set, right, any subset. You know, so whose modulus, that means whose, uh, you know, size would be between 2 to mod of v minus 2. So here, what is mod of v? The here, what is mod of v? That means what is the size of the vertex set? Six. Six, right? So which means u can be any subset number of with number of nodes between two to four, right? And for those all subsets of those possible sizes we apply this third constraint which is summation x i j is less than equal to mod of u minus 1. So now you have to explain to me that how this constraint ensures that there will be no subtools. We check for each such subset that if that subset forms a subtool or not. If it will form a subtool then the total sum will be exactly equal to the size of the subset and mm. we are taking less than equal to one min that minus one. Mm. Right. 
very good so um sir they for yeah tell me sir then the number of uh, such uh, constants will become exponential right exponential. because we have to take every combination exactly exactly okay, okay. that is why that is why uh, tsp is an np hard problem it cannot be solved for large problems okay ah, because these number of sub two uh, sub two elimination constants become exponentially high for large graphs for you know as you go, you know uh, uh, try to solve large problems with uh, many number of cities say 100 1000 2000 right then you cannot solve it by the available algorithms so that is why it is also called as one of the very difficult problems to solve in the art hmm. so but everyone has understood how this sub two constraint works sir so can you, i explain once again yeah so say the, the you know with that with the presence of these two first two constants suppose these sub two sub form now you see you take this sub two uh, it has size 3 right s 1 5 so these three nodes are there and how many edges are there again three similarly the other sub two also you know three nodes and three edges so all the sub twos will have uh, equal number of edges as the number of nodes right but you only want that only in case of um, the final one that means the for the entire so if you consider all six nodes then six edges that is fine right so for anything which is less than v for any u right for any subset which is less than six nodes right you do not you are you are putting a constant as summation of xij that means the sum of all edges that means the number of edges you know summation xij is the number of edges in that sub two should be less than equal to u minus 1 that means it should be less than the number of nodes exactly the number of nodes so in this way so if you consider this s15 so here mod of u is 3 so you check Uh, if it fits into this constant case, so three means it it is lying between two to four, right? So that means this sub two constant will apply to this. So it says that summation x i j should be less than equal to mod of u minus one, which is means three minus one, which is two. But here, what is the case? You know, you have three. So which means when you add this constraint for this particular sub two u, this sub two will not be formed. this constant will prevent it to form are you getting it or not yes sir uh, only for the full hamiltonian cycle covering all the nodes this is uh, you know the number of edges should be equal to the number of nodes so that's why i have written mod of v minus 2 which is less than equal to so if i put strictly less than if i rewrite this constant putting a slightly different you know uh, thing then it will be sorry it will be one strictly less than mod u strictly less than v minus 1 so for all subsets which is less than the total number of nodes the complete graph right these constants the sub two elimination constants will apply but if you consider all nodes that means all s 1 2 3 4 5 5 then this sub two constant will not hold valid why because here u is v so in that case this you know this constant will not apply so only in that case you will accept the number of edges is equal to the number of nodes in the graph am i able to make you understand or not how the, how the constant works and when does it work when i mean in which cases uh, you apply this constraint yes sir okay. 
So now you see that uh, as we have seen that as we have rightly said this uh, number of use or possibilities of these use are huge in number and often exponential. So that is why uh, even today PSP is unsolvable. Okay. Um, you can only solve it for a very small number of nodes, number of small number of cities. But at the same time, we have many heuristic and you know soft computing based meta heuristic strategies, right? Like genetic algorithm and you know particle swarm optimization, simulated annealing, and many such algorithms are there, which are meta heuristics or even heuristics that try to find a good solution. Right, not necessarily the optimal because you cannot guarantee optimality for a heuristic or meta heuristic solution. So they what they do, they uh, they implement some randomized search strategy and try to find uh, uh, a good solution, okay, a reasonably good solution, but they cannot guarantee whether it is optimal or not. Hmm. So I mean, you will read more about it in the optimization and heuristic methods course if you take it in our department. So there we cover what are, you know how uh, what are the different types of approximation algorithms or heuristic and meta heuristic algorithms to tackle NP hard problems. Okay, but in this course we are al al always focused on uh, optimal solution, right, and optimization techniques. So I'll not cover those things in this class. But you just be aware, uh, be informed that this is a very hard problem to solve. Hmm. Um, now, this is for you. Uh, so, here I have given you a problem. So this is called again a fixed charge problem. So this is another problem. Fixed charge problem. So let us see what it is. There are three telephone companies, Vodafone, Airtel and Idea. Now Vodafone charges a flat rupee 16 per month plus 0.25 rupees a minute for call, right? Similarly for Airtel and Idea, this data are given. The total time, the total call time per month is 200 minutes for a subscriber. Say, say I have I have a mobile which has three SIMs, SIM cards, Vodafone. I mean the provisions of three SIM cards, Vodafone, Airtel, Idea. I know their rates, right? The flat rate and as well as the variable rates, right? For calling, and then I know my requirement that you know per month I need to call approximately 200 minutes. Now the decision is that which SIM cards I will buy, right? Should I go for all the three SIM cards? Or, uh, I mean, what, what is the optimal uh, uh, decision to buy, to purchase the SIM cards? And how to distribute the calls among these SIM cards, among these operators? So these are the two decisions, right? That which operator you want to take finally, and how much time you distribute your calls to those operators. Is the problem clear? And what is the objective? Objective, of course, is to minimize the monthly telephone bill. Right. So this objective is given. Some constraints are given, right? Uh, like 200 minutes of call, right? And the cost is given for these different operators. So can you formulate it as an integer program and tell me what is the best decision? What is the optimal decision?
So you formulate and let me know. Sir, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the objective, uh, okay, so uh, I'm taking the variables uh, which is no, hidden just one in the slide. One minute, let, let, let others, others okay. also work okay, okay. it out and then uh, let yeah, others fine, fine. also explain. Hello. Shuda Bolchi, Amito, a place, you can go to Kibabe, Kikota, installed, installed, Ugulo, Ki. Ha, 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 I was a Korean Karanata going to Argenta, she will then I have on a thing. I got it over to Manakina Haini. I have to Argenti got the way. Tigasa. I'm not going to project could do the party of the easy. Tigasa, Tigasa, okay. Tigasa. Now, me bullet in number number to the end of the way of current away. C one, C one, one forty eight. No, no, C1, C1. 0 0.25 uh, x1 x2 x3 so basically y1 y2 y3 is the, your decision whether to take the connection or not right yes and and x1 they are x2 like x3 defined are your call times yes okay so total is equal to 100 x1 x2 plus x3 is equal to 100 and 
this is greater than or equal to zero, so this is fine. And then, but you know, if this is not sufficient, you see here, I have written other three constraints. So these constraints are known as where is the open board? Just one minute. Okay, yeah. So here I have written, see these three constraints. Can you explain why I have written these three additional constraints here? X1 is less than or equal to 200 by 1. Why I have written? It will ensure that if X1 is greater than 0, then Y1 has to be 1. Because if y1 is 0, then right hand side is 0. Mm -hmm. Then x1 so should this become. This is basically it is called link constraint. Link constraints. Okay. What are link constraints? Link constraints basically they link multiple types of variables. So here we have defined two types, right? So earlier in all the other problems, in assignment problem, in TSP, in knapsack, we had only one type of variable. There were many, but one type. For example, xij, right? Uh, but here we see two types of variables. One is for dec deciding whether to take to take the connection or not, and the other, how much call you want to distribute, how, ma how many minutes, right? But essentially, these two variables are interlinked because if you take a connection, then you have to distribute some calls. If you do not take, you cannot distribute. So this relationship is explained in this constraint. So you can interpret it in, in this manner, x1 less than or equal to 200 y1. So which means that if you decide to take the connection y1, so if y1 is 1, then the maximum call you can distribute to it must be limited to 200 minutes. x1 should be less than or equal to, so that is the, you know, maximum um, value of x1. Right. So there is a limit. Maximum value of x1 is 200. And if y1 is 0, that means if you do not take the connection, then what happens? x1 will be less than or equal to 0. Right. But you again have x1 greater than or equal to 0 as a part of your variable definition. So it will these two constants will force x1 to be zero right so which means if you do not take any connection it will force the value of x1 to zero and this is very important why suppose if we do not write these constraints then it can happen suppose y1 it decides to be zero right and then x1 it can make some positive quantities at 10. nothing in this program would have prevented the formation. This is a feasible solution, isn't it? If I do not include these three link constraints. Is it a feasible solution or not? Y1 is 0 and X1 is 10 and maybe accordingly we adjust the other values of Y2, Y3, X2, X3. This will be, you, you can easily generate a feasible solution like this, isn't it? But this doesn't make any sense. It is not rational. If you do not take any connection, how can you spend 10 minutes on that SIM card, right? So that is why when you see that this is a very important uh, thing to remember in modeling. So whenever you have some real life problem, you understand, okay, there are different types of decision variables. You have to also understand the relationship between those variables, how they depend on each other. And accordingly, you have to write those relationships also. So these are not explicit constraints, they are called implicit constraints, you know, link constraints, relationship constraints are implicit constraints. But they have to be explicitly written because your computer is dumb. If you do not inform these relationships, it can easily give you an infeasible, an infeasible solution like this, you know? right? Okay.
So whenever you, you deal with multiple types of variables, you always remember you have to introspect that what how they depend on each other and accordingly write those constants. So now, so we are now quite familiar with the different types of modeling approaches, right? We have seen uh, some uh, examples, right? And we have tried very simple, you know, basic modeling. And then in assignment, other exercises will be given, some more complex modeling exercises will be given, huh? which will help you because see, ultimately, ultimately this time and in, in this age, modeling is what that matters. That is that requires human intervention. Because once you have the model ready, once you have the LP program or the NTJ program, then you can easily pass it on to a software uh, like Cplex, like Groby, uh, like Pulp in Python. So they are able to, the, the algorithms are there and they will solve it. So you don't need to solve it manually as such these days, right? Uh, so your contribution comes in modeling. And when you join some industry where you work as a manager, right, in managerial posts or data analysts, uh, or operations in operations profile, right? Uh, so there, uh, different types of real life problems come to you, where you have to, you need to make optimal decisions. So your contribution would be how to mathematically model, how to write the objective functions, the constraints, the variables, right? And then the remaining thing will be done by the software. No issues about that, right? Uh, but most of us. Because it is modeling is not a science, it is basically an art and it, it, you know, perfection comes with practice. So as such, there is no theory that how to model the problem, you know, no theory, it's an art. So if you are good at it, you will be able to do it better than others, right? Uh, there is no method, there is no science or there is no theory. So you have to just um, try it, that's all. But when it comes to solution algorithms and all, then there is a theory, there is solution mechanisms and all those. So that's why they can be coded. So science can be coded, right? Technology can be coded, can be streamlined, but art cannot be streamlined, cannot be coded. So that is why we human beings, you know, we often appreciate art often feels, you know, art is closer to our art than science and technology. And this is the reason. Science and technology means more routine thing. That means it will not deviate. Whatever is done, you know, is there, it has to be done in that way only. But suppose when you paint, right, or when you play an instrument, you can do it in your own way. And I'll give you examples where the same problem can be modeled in different ways. Later on, okay, you will see. And depending on your way of modeling, uh, the time that will be taken by the software, you know, to get to, get to the optimal solution will be different. Okay, so I'll give you an assignment now on this integer program where I'll give you many exercises on modeling part. Okay, which you will enjoy. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. Now, see, now let, let us try to understand what kind of algorithm now is applied to integer program to solve it because we have seen last week at the start of this topic integer programming that simple round off doesn't work right so if you relax it to an lp and then solve it by simplex and then at the end you try to round off the fractional values to nearest integers it may lead you to invisible solutions and you know there is no guarantee that it will give you optimal solution Fine. Uh, so, so uh, now let us see what is that method to solve an integer program. So, what is an integer program? If you essentially, if you if you look at an integer program, if you try to draw it, say. Uh, maybe I'll go to this graph. Yeah.
So I have taken this example, right? Say this IP is given to you. Maximize Z is 5x1 plus 4x2 subject to x1 plus x2 less than equal to 5 and this is less than equal to 45 and x1 x2 is non-negative integer that means they are not allowed to take fractional values only integer non-negative so on the positive side right so like 0 1 2 3 anything they can take up to infinity right so if i simply plot it graphically because this is of two dimension what do we get we get this graph this one. Now here you see that these are the you know these two constant boundaries which give me a feasible region. Now if it were uh, a LP, that means if x1 and x2, so this x-axis is the x1 and the y-axis is the x2 say, right? So if they were continuous, then this shaded region would have been my feasible region, right? If x1 and x2 would have been continuous, that means all the points that are lying within this shaded region would be a feasible solution for me and then the corner points would be the basic feasible solutions and we know how to solve it by using simplex right but here there is a problem what is the problem here x1 and x2 are both integers so that is why only the dots the black dots that you are seeing in this graph in this picture right only these dots are feasible solutions do you agree with it or not? Say I'm making it green. You see these dots or not? Yes, sir. Do you agree with it or not? Yes. Then why I am saying the entire the shaded region is not feasible anymore? Because if you take anything outside it, it will be continuous variable, right? It will take fractional value. So which means that it is infeasible. So in integer programming, this is the peculiar thing that only discrete points are um, feasible right now for these examples say if you look at the lp and if you would have solved uh, by graphical method right or simplex method you would have got this corner point this is the optimal solution you would have got this as the optimal solution but interestingly this is not an integer point you see what is the value x1 is 3.75 and x2 is 1.25 and z is 23.75 so it is not an integer solution right then what is the optimal solution can you can you tell me graphically that uh, what 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 is the optimal solution what could be the optimal solution so anything maybe so you have to scan the, in the neighboring integer points right so like this point, this point, or this point, right? And you have to see what is the value of z. And accordingly, you decide where it takes the maximum value. So essentially, what you are doing, you have to come inside also sometimes. So you are not in the simplex. This is the big difference from simplex. In simplex for LP, we are only traveling from one corner point to another corner point. There was no need to go inside the physical polyhedron. Here, what you are doing, uh, the LP polyhedron, if you look at the LP poly, if actually the optimal integer point or feasible integer, you know, uh, it may lie inside. So you need a mechanism to go inside. Right. You need a mechanism to go inside the LP polyhedron in order to find the integer solution, optimal solution. Now branch, so this method is known as branch and but there are other methods also like cutting plane methods huh, and other methods. So in this course, we will only read about branch and bound method. So branch and bound method is a divide and conquer strategy, which allows you to cut through the solution space and go deep inside the physical region, right? And to find the optimal name. Now, can someone tell me what is a divide and conquer strategy? because many of you are from computer science background. So you must have learned it in your algorithms course. What is a divide and conquer strategy? Like divide the problem into two similar small problems and then combine the solution to get the solution to the original problem. Like recursively you continue doing this and then recursively you continue combining the solution. Right. Can you 
give an example of any say algorithm or any method which is divide and conquer. Uh, one sorting is there, merge sort. Right. Right. Some sorting algorithms are of this type. Divide and conquer. Here what we do, this is also a type of divide and conquer strategy. Uh, so we will uh, see the details of this algorithm in the next class. But uh, just to brief you, uh, you know, what we do, we because we know how to solve LP, you know, by simplex, so much, so many classes, uh, you know, are spent on LP and simplex method. And actually, if you look at the uh, matrix algebra, right, uh, or or the system of your know, solving system of equations, uh, you can only apply those techniques for continuous variables. There is no method to solve a system of equations for you know, discrete variables. Suppose I, I give you an equation, say I say you 3x1, say I say you, say 3x1 plus 5x2 equal to 2 right and then say 2x1 plus 7x2 equal to 3 okay if I ask you to solve for this you can solve it and give me the value of x1 and x2 as long as I give you the freedom that x1 and x2 are continuous variables but if I put to a constraint that x1 is integer type x1 and x2 belongs to z plus z. that means the positive integer then there is no method to solve it do you know are you aware of any method to solve this any algebraic method is there have you read anywhere this type of situation no right so what you have to do, but anyway, we have these constraints, linear constraints, which have to be, you know, followed. So what we do, we first relax the problem as an LP, solve it by simplex, and then apply this branch and bound method or this divide and conquer strategy to, uh, you know, divide the uh, solution space, right? Create new sub problems and then again solve them by LP. And we keep doing it until we get an integer solution and then we have different bounding mechanisms right on those solutions so that uh, we prove optimality of the final integer solution so i'll give you the details of this method uh, tomorrow uh, but the it, it starts like this so you solve an lp so when you solve this lp as an lp you get this solution right x1 is 3.75 x2 is 1.25 and j is this then what you do you observe that let me branch on x1 that means x1 variable so i add two constraints to the system one is x1 less than equal to 3 this one x1 less than equal to 3 and another one is x1 greater than equal to 4 so if i add these two constraints new constraints it was not there earlier right what i am gaining and what i am losing what it is doing actually if i add these two constraints to the system it is basically removing the one one this lp subspace right solution some you know some cutout portion is there right which is removing so this is being removed by these two constraints now tell me is there any integer solution in that cut in that removed space no 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 so are we really losing anything in terms of the solution of the integer program no no right we are not losing out any feasible integer solution so but we have created so this problem this integer programming problem is now equivalent to solving these two problems separately this is an again an integer programming problem and this is another integer so these two are two sub problems 
we have created a smaller one, right? Now suppose I consider this left hand side, this, this part. Now again I apply the same method. So this is an integer program, so only black dots are visible, but I cannot solve it. So let us again solve it as an LP. So I again solve it as an LP and then by using simplex, right? Uh, then I get this point as the corner point. Final optimal solution for this LP. Now this point incidentally is what? Is an integer point. Incidentally. It may not happen for all problems, but in this case, incidentally, it has become an integer point. What do you know from it? That now you have found an integer solution accidentally by, you know, by solving the LP, which means you do not need to now, you know, break the solution space anymore because all the other solutions, including these black dots, which are inside it will be inferior to this point in terms of objective value because this is optimal and it is an integer so it means it is a feasible solution to the original problem right integer feasible solution and all the points that are inside this LP are inferior including the black dots which are the integer solutions right but you don't need to check them examine them anymore you can declare okay I have found a point which is superior than all other points that are all other integer points that are inside this region Right. So this part is solved. So similarly, you again solve this part LP3. Okay. So in this way, you keep solving till you, uh, you know, prove optimality. That means all integer points for these subproblems are found and compared against each other for the objective value. Right, and which one is giving you a higher objective value that will be the optimal solution for the original problem. So the, pro the branch and bound technique works like this. It, it adds two constraints. These are branching constraints, x1 less than or equal to 3 and x1 greater than or equal to 4. To remove subspace from the LP, create two smaller problems. And then again solve those smaller problem by again, you know, applying LP and a simplex method. If you again find fractional, then you again branch on those uh, fractional variable. You again create sub problems, right? In this way, you keep doing till you find integer solution. Okay. For large problems, this may take large amount of time, even two days, three days to reach to an optimal solution because you know is it accidentally you are found in the second iteration itself an integer solution but you may not find it you may keep on dividing you keep on adding nodes keep on branching right it may go on forever and for some problems which are difficult you know the branch and bound method may not converge at all it may take even one year to get to the optimal solution so i'll come to the, all the points and tomorrow I'll formally discuss that how to create the branch and bound tree and then how to uh, do a breadth first search, depth first search in the tree in order to find out and all those things. So I request you to, you know, brush up your knowledge in depth first search, breadth first search, different search strategies on graphs, right? Uh, so that you can correlate it with this technique, okay? Any question? No, sir. <laughs>